first of all, I've got to thank all of you for turning turning up here in 72 hours. I mean, Mark, thank you for pulling this together. We're so privileged to be um, at your home, hosted at 1880. So thank you for the opportunity. Um, and I think it would be incomplete if I didn't. Use of Mark is the, the usual term is partner in crime. We use the term partner in good. Right? So my two partners in good, uh, also fellow I, uh, Rajiv Shivastav, who's here somewhere. He generally blends in the background, but does a lot of stuff in in the foreground. And uh, and Narendra Singh, uh, who's also uh, who's also here. So thank you uh, for that support. And of course for uh, Kalashji, for you to take out time. I know it's been a very busy trip. You've had a lot of your fellow Nobel laureates here. To, um, to meet and mingle with, and for you to take out time for us. Um, we're really, really privileged, delighted, and extremely grateful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone who is present here today. It is my privilege. So, we, um, since we've got this great gathering of very like-minded people, I thought we'll, we'll kick it off with maybe a little bit of, um, sorry, I've just started wearing reading glasses, so it becomes a little bit hard for me. Um, I wanted to, I guess, kick it off with your journey. And, um, you know, we have heard many of your interviews, many fireside chats like this. Uh, I watched your Nobel speech. Um, and every time I'm amazed that as time passes, your relevance in the context of what you discuss is absolutely in line with how times change. And I think it's... Um, it's an opportunity for us to get your insights on what the future holds and what we can do collectively in our small way to make a difference. Um, so I'll head back, head straight into the bare naked truth of the hows, the whys, and the whats of your inspirational journey. I know you've had a lot of challenges, um, some of which, or most of which, that we don't actually get to see publicly. And, but I think the reason you are where you are is because you have had many more victories and successes uh, over the years. So I want to start with um, the story I heard about the cobbler's son. Um, when, you know, when you were going to school, you saw a cobbler's son. And can you give us a view of what that did to change your perspective in life? And um, how did that contribute to where you are today? Thank you. Thank you, Amitji. Thanks to Mark and uh, Rajiv Ji and all of you once again. You are taking back to my early childhood memories. It was the very first day of my schooling when I was entering in uh, my local municipal school. I was five and a half year old. I encountered a very awkward situation. A cobbler boy my age sitting outside the school gate and looking at us whether we are going to give him some job or shoe shining or anything. And I was disappointed seeing him because I was told since my early days that every child is supposed to go to school one day and I was preparing myself for that. So when I entered in classroom, I asked my teacher, sir, why a child is sitting outside and not with the rest of us in the classroom? He said, come down, this is your first day, make friends, be familiar with the school. And this is very common, he said. The poor children work and help families because they are poor. I was not convinced. I didn't know much about these phrases of being poor children or what is common and what is uncommon in society. So when I came back from school, I saw the boy was still sitting under the sun and uh, there was no umbrella, there was nothing, and none of us had any job to give to him because we were all wearing new shoes. It was the new session of school. 
But the boy was still looking at us miserably, helpless. I took his eyes with me at my home. And I asked my mother and other family members, everybody tried to answer in the same way that it is not uncommon, calm down. Why are you so uh, disappointed? But every morning and evening I used to see that boy, sometimes sitting alongside his father. One day I gathered my courage and went straight to, to them while coming back from his school. The boy was shy, but the man cobbler stood up with folded hands. I know many of you know Indian caste system and Indian society where these people who are uh, untouchable or considered to be untouchable in the past, belonging to lowest caste of society and cobblers were among them. So he stood up and said, sir, I, I never thought about it. My father, my grandfather, me, everybody started this work since childhood and so is my son. And then he looked with helpless and helpless face and eyes at me and said, Babuji, school jane ke liye to aap log hain, hum to isi ke liye paida hue hain. He said, sir, you guys are born to go to school, but we are born to work. That made me very sad, very sad and angry. I started crying as a six-year-old child or five-and-a-half-year-old child. His question was that, his answer was that, we are born to work. And that remained the question for the rest of my life. Why some children are born to work at the cost of their livelihood? at the cost of their future livelihood, at the cost of their childhood, freedom, education, care. And that has given me a different perspective of life. Whatever my teachers say, whatever my family members and other wise people say, may not be just based on justice and righteousness. It could be the complacency which is going on in the minds of society and people for ages. That made me angry, more and more angry. And I started looking the world with that eye and I could find that there are so many wrongs, so many injustices going on in the society and I have to do something. But as a child, what could I do? So sometimes we create comfort zones and hide inside our self-made or others made shells or shields or boxes and hardly we find courage to disrupt it, hardly we find courage to change it. And I know that you and many of you are disruptors in your own way you brought changes in technology, you brought changes in businesses and management and governance and in so many fields of life because you had courage to question some of those things which was going on for ages, for centuries. So question is the key. I learned in my childhood through this cobbler boy and I am thankful to him and his father. I think that's... Um very yeah. oh okay so I always forget these videos uh, we we do have a video to play uh, maybe we'll do it in about five minutes uh, I just want to at least close off the early chapter of Kalashi's life um, and <clears throat> I think I would be remiss if I did not welcome his wonderful wife who has been his companion for 44 years and pretty much been through this journey all through. Um, so very warm welcome and, and thank you for all the, all the support that you've given behind the scenes. You always, you need, you need a partner in good 
and he's, you're fortunate to have a life partner in good. So um, I just wanted to pick up on that thread that you just shared because it didn't take you that much longer after your childhood to actually start doing the work because you started in your early 20s and you know you are an engineer you studied engineering um, and you know we'll delve into some of your um, skills around mathematics and technology later but I wanted to understand you know what sparked this movement for you um, you know pretty much at the beginning of your adult life thank you actually engineering uh, helped me a lot I studied uh, high voltage transmission and transformer design. Um, so when I uh, followed my heart or my passion to work for children, I decided to give up this career. I taught in the university for about a year and a half, the same subject. But I learned to be more rational, to be more scientific. I learned systemic problems and the systems. I learned to be analytical. I learned that how the input and output ratio, the efficacy and efficiency uh, has to be kept in mind and the final outcomes and how to be strategic, how to design the things and how to uh, design in such a way that the efficacy is maximum and so on and so forth. So those things were equally implicable for social transformation. It is not the electrical transformation all the time from high voltage to low or low to high, but social transformation or social engineering in a way. The society also has several elements, several variables, several factors. And then we have to learn the systems and systemic problems. So I realized that this issue of children or child slavery, child labor is a kind of hidden issue under the carpet. People didn't talk about, talk about it, didn't know much about it. There was no awareness. And people accepted this as a social norm. If the poor children are helping their families or working somewhere, nothing is uncommon. As for years and years, for ages, the women were considered the second great citizens. Or even now, this gender parity, gender equity in our personal lives, in our social lives, in our political lives and economic life is still a big challenge. It's a big road, long road to walk. But at least now we see the change happened in last, say, 50 years or so in terms of gender equity, but not uh, the same similar thing was about the children, or even worse. So I started writing in magazines, then I started my own journal, and one day a uh, frail, uh, old looking man knocked on my door. His name was Vasal Khan. And he came with one expectation that I am going to give him to give him some advice or write his story on my magazine so that uh, officers and bureaucracy can, can read it and perhaps they can act. S but I was shocked when he told that 17 years ago, he and his newly married wife were lured away from his village in Uttar Pradesh, Aligarh district, to Punjab, near Sarhind. And there they were confined to a brick kiln. Not only this uh, couple, but so many other couples and so many other families were taken to work. In those 17 years, nobody has paid anything. Nobody was allowed to leave. They were just given some food to eat and forced to work as machines or even animals or worse than animals. And he was crying and uh, holding my feet and saying that, please help my daughter, Sabo, help my daughter. 
she could be sold any time to a brothel because a brothel agent came and started bargaining the price but somehow it did not materialize so i did not have courage to run away before but because of my daughter could be sold any time i ran away in the middle of night in the in a brick loaded truck that was in 1981 the month of march early march so my dear sisters and brothers young friends when i was writing this story i felt that if she was my sister or my daughter what would i do think like a father not think feel like a father feel like a brother and i gave up my pencil and copy and i told vasal i'm not going to write this story i'm going to go to rescue your daughter and all those children men and women he said no 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 these people are mafia they are criminals they will kill you i said i don't care i took him to my home and i tell you friends my home was in 8 feet by 10 feet store room which i have taken on rent after giving up my career in in in, Del- in uh, madhya pradesh where i was born and grew up and moved to delhi for this magazine and other things so my wife me and my one year old son was living three of us were living in that small store room uh, belonging to a, a government officer he sublet so vasal was brought over there and we said you can sleep with us and he was he was shocked actually uh, he could not believe he thought he was thinking that i should be a government officer i should be a politician leader i can help but when he came to my home and my landlady started uh, you know uh, complaining that uh, how could you come these filthy dirty people and we are trying to convince her but uh, we were converting uh, conver- our conversation was in hindi and vasal uh, could understand then he said sir i will go and stay somewhere in the at the railway platform i said no next day i asked my wife sumedha let us sell or mortgage some of our, your wedding ornaments and organize some logistics at least we need a truck to bring those 30 40 people and maybe a car or some friends will go with me so i convinced a few friends of us we went there and we were beaten up uh, me and my friends had to come barefooted torn clothes vasal khan was caught and we were in very bad shape the truck driver has ran away so we have to run and walk miles but i never we came empty hands but i never gave up i never learned to give up because truth always wins justice always wins humanity will always prevail that is my very very firm belief since my childhood whatever difficulties and obstacles come but truth is always truth you cannot mix it with anything it's shining so i came with empty hands but not with empty heart so after coming back to delhi i met some lawyers they helped me they didn't know much about what to do but then there was a there was an old british law habeas corpus we approached the high court under that provision and through the habeas corpus we were able to rescue in fact all those 36 children women and men were brought and produced before the high court uh, and the police brought them punjab police and within two weeks these children women men including my beautiful sister sabo 15 year old sabo was freed this was the first documented incident first recorded incident in the history of india and history of humankind when the civilian effort or civilian intervention 
has freed some children from slavery. So it's not a long ago. I mean, the history of humankind is millions of years or thousands of years, but uh, it is just about 40, 45 years ago, 43 years ago. And let me tell you, when I was bringing these children back from, um, uh, from the court, high court, uh, we were all walking on the streets. Amit, you won't believe, you, you know Delhi. So our office was, uh, office was in a balcony of my friend in the back side of the balcony near Mandi House. So from High Court to Mandi House, you can easily walk. So when we were walking on that, uh, that broad road, um, these children were jumping on the streets because that was beyond, beyond their comprehension. They were, they were born and grew up there and they had no, no imagination of these kind of things in Delhi. So it was like if several uh, frogs are kept inside a bucket and suddenly you open the, the cover, uh, then these uh, frogs jump on the streets and the cars were honking. There were not so many cars, but cars were honking. Everybody was stunned. What is happening? It's kind of theater. Children were rushing here and there and running on the street because that was a great playground for them. But after every two or three minutes, a mother goes and hugs her son. A father goes and hugs her, his daughter or son. And they start crying of joy. And Amitji, I, have, I was a very, uh, I was fond of religions and religious text. In my teenager, uh, uh, as a teenager, I, I read uh, Gita and uh, Holy Quran and Holy Bible. I read Ramayana and I remember most of, most of the part of Ramcharit Manas Abdul Zidas in my young age. So I know about uh, moksha, mukti, the emancipation, liberation, these kind of things spiritually. And I was very fond of the great heroes of, of my country who fought for freedom and we know about freedom, the political meaning of freedom at that age. But when the tears rolled down on the cheeks of those mothers, mothers who lost all the hope that this may happen one day, hugging their children. And the children started crying out of joy. Those tears were my emancipation. This was the time, first time in my life, I felt that I'm being freed. That was the first time I could feel the glimpse of God on the faces of those mothers, those fathers, and those children in those tears. If God is not there, where is the God? I don't know how many people and how they have witnessed or seen or darshan kiye God ke. Lekin I tell you that since then, I never looked back because I was able to, to feel my God outside and inside both. So that was my journey. <coughs> Thank you. Kalashi, as um, I, um, <clears throat> you know, I, <clears throat> I don't often get lost for words when I do these. Um, no, and your father told that you should shine. You should I, overshine yeah, me I, today. I, Amit, I, I tell you, you are going <laughs> to do it. Absolutely. This morning, my wife, you told to my wife that she's glowing, but she also said that you, you look like uh, uh, coming from Kashmir and uh, your face is glowing. Thank you. Isn't? Thank you. Yeah. I think everybody is saying yes, but what about his wife? <laughs> he glows all the time. Actually, you, you, you see him glowing all the time. <laughs> um, no, thank you. And... It is true, my, uh, my, my father did, I had a long chat with him yesterday. He was actually sharing more about your history and he was very passionate about this. He said, you've done many of these, uh, many, many of these. Um, I've never watched any one of them, but I'm gonna watch this one, so you better shine in it. So, um, but I, I, I think um, a time when you're lost for words is perhaps a good time to actually play the video 
and, and make sure that we do justice to setting the right context. Possible to have another cup of tea? Maybe it would have been easier before the video. <laughs> um, it's, um, I mean, there's been, you know, so much said, so much that we read and hear. Uh, you shared your story of how you started the first rescue mission. Um, and since then, you've actually created a global movement. So clearly, there's a whole bunch of people who are waiting to be part of um, your mission. Uh, around the world, I I thought it'd be a good opportunity to understand how has that changed now, you know, now that you have the the entire movement with you, um, how does the foundation and how do you go about uh, rescuing these kids now, and what does that process involve? Well, uh, I started uh, with. Uh, rescuing children from slavery after the first incident uh, of uh, Sabo and Vasel Khan. I started getting uh, complaints and information from several sources. Uh, within a week, we rescued a group of other people, men, women, and children, and then it went on. But then we realized that it is not enough. How many children we will rescue? We have to find other ways. 
and I have come with uh, a clear concept uh, to make it a complete circle with an argument again uh, my inner engineer has helped that there is a vicious circle or a kind of a vicious triangle between three things poverty child labor and illiteracy that makes the full circle of perpetual exploitation and abuses and miseries abuse etc for example today we have 160 million children in full time jobs and about 50 60 million children who are working in part time jobs so it's little more than 200 million globally on the other hand 200 or 230 million children are out of school out of them 40 million have never seen classrooms they have never been to school another 180 190 million dropped out from primary or secondary schools. They must be in schools according to United Nations uh, commitment under the Sustainable Development Goals. So 200 million roughly, 200 million child laborers, 200 million out of school children, and little more than 200 million jobless adults in the world. Joblessness has grown child labor has grown and school dropout has also increased due to pandemic. These things have uh, exacerbated in the same order. So every single child laborer is working at the cost of one adult's job. Every single child is working at the cost of education. So 160 million children means 160 million empty seats in the classrooms. 160 million jobs taken away by children instead of their parents or adults. The parents are not preferred in jobs because they are expensive workforce. Children are the cheapest. That is 160 million. And that also means the 160 million missed out climate actions. So that makes the whole vicious circle today. And that has been there since beginning. So we brought this issue of education, poverty elevation programs, and elimination of child labor have to go hand in hand. So we started making interventions in it. We knew that there was no law on child labor in India. There was an old British law which was never used. We fought for enactment of laws started finding some good politicians in all parties and knocked on their door, sat with them, tried to convince that how important is such a law for the largest democracy of the world, India. Some of them convinced and a law has been enacted as our humble results in 1986 for the first time. It was a poor, weak law which is obsolete now then we kept on fighting for the amendment in the law and several amendments have been made. So that was the legal uh, thing. We had to fight for education because education is key to equality, key to justice, it's key to gender equality, it's key to prosperity, as need not to say to you. So Indian constitution or many constitutions in the world did not have this provision of education as a fundamental right or constitutional right. It was the part of government policies but not as fundamental right. And we fought for it because we wanted to have a law. But law cannot be enacted without the constitutional provision. So uh, I came with this idea when I was physically thrown away by a headmaster and some teachers um, from a school 
because I was insisting that some of the children whom I freed from slavery should be enrolled in schools and there was no legal right uh, that time uh, that was back in uh, late 80s or early 90s. So we had to fight for a constitutional amendment. I am saying it like that, it was like uh, bringing in another cup of tea for me. <laughs> As an ordinary person, how can you think of uh, changing India's constitution? <laughs> and people laughed at me and mocked at me everywhere that, Kailas, you are thinking of amending India's constitution and you are not even in the politics. You cannot win the election of a corporate or a panchayat and how could you think of uh, changing constitution because it requires two-thirds of majority. I said, after all, they are human beings. They are fathers, mothers of some children. I will knock on the doors of their hearts. I will knock on the court of their soul. I will believe in that. I will believe in a human sitting inside every body, the human being. So, we did it. And we marched across the country from Kanyakumari to Kashmir to Delhi for more, almost five, six months with this demand and galvanized not only the public support, but 163 members of parliament from different political parties, and some of them are ministers now, some of them were the ministers in last governments. They joined as, as parliament members. And when we reached in Delhi, Amitji, within six months, Indian Parliament has amended constitution and made education as fundamental right. So, and the law followed it. So, enactment of law was our another strong intervention. But laws are not implemented on its own. There's a lot of corruption, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, complacency in the minds of bureaucracy and so on and so forth. Uh, and some of the, uh, the law enforcement officers were connived with the, uh, with the traffickers and slave masters and so on. So it was not an easy task. So we kept on going to the court. We started with the Supreme Court, not from the local court. We know how the court functions. The local courts could easily be influenced or bribed or they have no knowledge, many of the judges. They had, uh, but now things have changed. So that was one aspect. The third one was that we realized that how to, where to take these children who are freed. So, in few, uh, in, in few years, we realized that we have to have a place, a rehabilitation center, where the children can learn, they can learn education, but also skills later on. And more importantly, how to restore their sense of childhood, the sense of freedom, the sense of belongingness with the communities and societies, and self-confidence, self-esteem, those things are important beside education. So we set up the first ashram, Mukti Ashram in Delhi, and that was a success story. Then we set up another ashram for girls, and then we set up the third one uh, in Rajasthan, that is a long-term rehabilitation center. So. Rehabilitation was the key. But how many centers we can set up? There are, there were some philanthropists, some good-hearted people, uh, partner in good in different way, and they have partnered with us, giving some money, and we, we were able to help a few hundred or few thousand children. But then we realized that this should be a state policy. So we kept on fighting for a new policy for the rehabilitation of children economic, social, and mental rehabilitation policy that is now in place, and the children who are freed from slavery, they are entitled for various benefits, but I think we have to prepare uh, them for that, we have to uh, keep them in our ashrams and so on. So that has become a model center. Then we went more deeper into the villages. Today we have 650 or more villages, what we call child-friendly villages. Child-friendly village is a village where all children, there's zero tolerance for any kind of abuse of children. No child labor, no child marriage, no child trafficking, no child sexual abuse, nothing. 
and that is possible only with the awareness but also the participation of village community and so on. So that was the community participation effort. And then the second is all children have to be in schools irrespective of their caste and communities and gender, girls especially, our focus has always been on girls. That is the second thing. Then the village children form their children's parliament by way of democratic election. And they learn democracy, they inculcate the values of leadership as well as uh, giving back to the society and helping each other and so on. So we try to teach those values right from their childhood at the village level. Um, and sometimes I say that politicians um, should go and learn from, and we bring politicians, ministers, etc., to learn from those children instead of giving sermons all the time and making promises all the time. I'm not against politics, but I am... I, I know the reality, that's why I'm saying it. So finally, the village panchayat, panchayat is the, the lowest but very, very powerful um, institution, official institution uh, in India, uh, the Indian governance system. So what we call the panchayati raj. So panchayat has powers, money, everything, budgetary allocations are there. And then we change their mind and make sure that children's parliament and the adult parliament of the village or children's assembly and elected assembly of children and elected assembly of village should work hand in hand in sync and that helped a lot. I'm not going into the details, you can read more uh, on websites and everything. There's so many, so much knowledge available, so many stories available, but this is another thing. Then the then very important thing Amitji was to involve uh, in fact, uh, to, to make the consumers aware and responsible. So we tried and we have been successful in launching several campaigns in the world which are taught in a number of uh, management schools in India and, and elsewhere in the world. Uh, the first effort of um, social uh, responsibility uh, of consumers, but also the social responsibility and social accountability. The whole discussion and debate of um, social accountability of businesses and corporations uh, came after that when we launched the campaign in the mid 80s or uh, late 80s uh, in uh, Germany and then in United States and this issue was discussed in European Parliament several times, in US Senate several times. I was invited to, uh, to interact um, with the, the groups of parliament members and even the special hearings were held in different countries on this issue of that, how the governments, the importing governments, exporting governments, consumers and the business leaders should uh, work hand in hand and find solutions, positive and creative solutions instead of being punitive and alleging each other. So we have come out with this idea of social labeling on Indian, Pakistanis and, um, uh, and Nepalese rugs and later on in chocolate and toy industries, sporting goods industry, so many industries. So I had a good experience working as friend, as brother, as a problem solver with some of the top industries um, in the world because we as human rights activists, when you are a social activist or human rights activist, it is very easy to allege that this industrial is wrong, this corporate is wrong, this, this business is, is, is wrong, and punitive measures have to be taken. Why can't we find solutions sitting together amicably? And we have seen the good results in reducing child laborers. The carpet industry, MSG, is, is an example that was the first industry where this corporate social responsibility and consumers, responsible consumerism and ethical businesses was launched uh, 30 years ago or so, uh, more than 30 years ago by, by me and my friends. That time, according to United uh, States, uh, State Department and Labor Department studies say that over a million children were engaged in child slavery and child labor in India, Pakistan and Nepal, uh, South Asian carpet industry. That number has come down in 30 years 
from 1 million child slaves or children in slavery to hardly 100,000. So 900,000 children were saved, but many more because the number was growing. But the most important result of that was the export, import, production, nothing has gone down, it grew because the consumers has, have demanded clean carpets, ethical carpets in Europe and America and the demand grew. So when 900 children were withdrawn, in their place 900,000 900, adult people, probably their own parents, probably their own relatives who, who were adults, were able to get jobs in place of those 900 child laborers. This is reported or this is documented in many places as an innovative, what they call the social entrepreneurship exam, to create over 900,000 jobs in one industry through this kind of intervention. So we made several kind of these things. So life is always learning. When my Nobel Prize came, people thought, many people said that now Kailash ji is going to become the celebrity. Some PR people came that exclusiveness, exclusivity is the power of a Nobel laureate. I told some of the Nobel laureates yesterday that why are you becoming so, so they are so exclusive, they are so great people, they are saintly people. But the problem is that uh, there should be a Nobel laureate of the ordinary people. So I thought that why not Kela Satyarthi, you should be easily accessible to everyone. I can meet. So uh, that uh, that was there. Um, so when they say that now you are a celebrity, I said no. Nobel Prize is just a comma in my life. It is not full stop. Full stop will come only when I see the end of child slavery with my own eyes in my lifetime. Kalashi, we have. Um, sorry. No, it is working. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, we have a whole room of obviously corporate folks, entrepreneurs, some investors. Um, and, you know, we were talking about how, you know, impact investments is becoming one of the fastest uh, growth areas. Um, we often talk about the exceptional stories that come out of Silicon Valley in terms of tech entrepreneurs, but perhaps you were the early entrepreneur of social entrepreneurship, human movement, and impact. So, so thank you for starting that. <clears throat> I think you have um, given a very good view of how the entire ecosystem can come together, and I won't ask you another question around it, because we have many other things to get through in a very, very short time. And, um, but I love the term you use around conscious politics, conscious industry, conscious business, and conscious capital. So uh, I think you sort of summed that up in uh, what you just shared with us. Can I um, switch gears and um, do some quick fire questions with you? OK, all right. I was, uh, I was writing some of these down because it, <clears throat> it has been made, uh, it's come to my attention that you actually have a great sense of humor. Uh, there are many things you enjoy. Is and it yet, true? Is it true? I, I, <laughs> I, 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 I think so. And I think um, you have a very special friend that you enjoy that repertoire with, uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So first of all, I wanted to understand what do you both talk about when you're sitting alone and, and catching up? Uh, you will be surprised to see some of the photos of me and His Holiness Dalai Lama. We are good friends, but he's like my father, he's like Guru, he's, I have, he is an extraordinary person, uh, a kind of moving compassion in a human body. So uh, having said that, when you see the photos, um, he, uh, when we meet, he holds my ears 
like that. <laughs> and I am holding his nose like that. He said, that can you listen? I said, can you live? <laughs> so people, things like that, it's, it's not uncommon. Uh, so uh, some years ago, we had a very, uh, very intense discussion, in fact, uh, argument. Um, he spoke uh, how to control your anger and how bad is the anger for human uh, biology and, and brain, uh, mentally, physically, etc. And I said, no, sir, no, uh, His Holiness, I, am, I don't agree with that. I am someone who loves anger and I call upon the people to become angry because they are already angry from inside but they keep on suppressing their angers here and there. Once in a while this anger uh, erupts and uh, that becomes uh, destructive. So anger is a human nature, it's a, it's a feeling, it's an emotion and that every emotion in your brain uh, brings additional energy. So anger is also an energy. So as an electrical engineer, if I could convert fire into, uh, into, into light and uh, refrigerators and air conditioners, uh, that was the transformation of energy. Uh, disruptive wind, winds and, uh, and water flows, we were able to convert them through generators and uh, make electricity, electricity for good. So why can't we convert our anger into positive, constructive uh, uh, things and make this world a better place? So I always, I'm angry on many things, but I keep my anger inside me and use it to understand why I was angry. If I'm, my anger is driven by hatred, revenge, then it turns into destruction. If I'm selfish and if I'm egoist and my anger is driven out of that, then I can, I can be violent. But if my anger is even deeper that why these things are happening, I, I start with why, how, and then um, there are some structural, deeper structural issues uh, which are responsible for slavery, child labor, child trafficking, online child sexual abuse or what not. Um, and then I try to ideate, find some ideas, convert my anger into ideas and my ideas into action. So that has been my argument for quite some time that be angry, anger for positive, anger for constructiveness and then use that anger for betterment of society. It's a power, it's an energy and Dalai Lama holds my ear like that. I said you have to answer this. Then he said, come, come to Dharamshala and he invited my wife, so he loves all my family. So we went, both of us went to Dharamshala and they spent a, almost a week sitting, talking, laughing, fighting. But his idea was that our conversation should be recorded and it should come in the form of a book. So now you will see this book in market in few months time early next year and that is what they call the book of compassion. So I'm not here to, you can invite me for, <laughs> for the book of, I, I cannot assure that the, uh, His Holiness may come but uh, the book of compassion would be the outcome of this uh, funny arguments and um, that is my relationship. Actually three of us have, had enjoyed our, our time uh, once in a while. It was Dalai Lama, it was uh, Archbishop Dushman Tutu and, and me. And uh, in front of them, I several times told that we have something in common because we will never grow, we will never become old, we, are, we, all, we will always remain children. So I am a child, you are a child and he is a child. Three of us are like children in the entire noble fraternity. We enjoy, we can laugh, we can cry, we can jump, we can dance, we can do anything because we never let our inner child die and that makes Dalai Lama. 
I am inspired by him. That makes uh, Archbishop Tutu, who just passed away, and I, I'm inspired by him too. Uh, but I live like that since my own childhood and still childhood. <clears throat> so clearly, Kalashji, you have made some exceptional friends along the way. Um, and of course, your, um, your special club of Nobel laureates. Um, and I guess you want to be um, the first among equals in terms of being the ordinary human being there. So I think that's, um, that's a wonderful uh, thought. Um, I know that we are running out of time. Uh, I wanted to open up if people had a couple of questions, if that's okay, Kalashi. Yes, sure, sure. Uh, I just wanted to leave with one last question. I have so many, but um, you know, I um, one question as an entrepreneur for me, for you, is you're you are like an entrepreneur. You've built a global movement. Um, there's more and more awareness of the purpose and implications of what needs to be addressed in the world with our new with our next generation whether it's to do with you know climate sustainability um, inclusion equity all of those factors are very important to the new generation and it, it is spurring a breed of the next generation of entrepreneurs what's the core message that you would like to leave for them well um, uh, I'm not a priest who can give messages and uh, I'm not a lecturer or not an academician or priest, leader, nothing, one of you. I could just think spontaneously that each one of us, each one of you, is not born without a purpose. If we believe in God, Allah or whatever, it is much more clear that God cannot be so stupid that he has sent us on the earth without any purpose. Then he could have made us uh, uh, something else, but not a living human being with human body and human heart, quite perfect. So we are born with some purpose and tremendous potential. So entrepreneurs, professionals, they have much more power and much more responsibility. Whatever you do today, you are writing the scripts of tomorrow. Sometimes you feel that you are earning money for yourself. Sometimes you feel that you are uh, bringing uh, wealth for yourself or bringing fame or name for yourself or craving power for yourself. It looks true, but the deeper truth is that your, every of your step in life, every of your day in life is going to bring about change in the society that could be good or bad. This is nothing static. So if we do something purposefully where you can feel the suffering of others, you can feel the issues of others, that is one way of living that makes you more happy, that makes you more satisfied, more peaceful. But the peace and satisfaction and happiness is very contagious. It's very infectious. If you live with that, then your aura, your, your being somewhere will influence, will affect other people. Try to live with that. So, you are not just money minting machines. I'm not saying that don't make money. The whole sustainable development goal idea is that people, prosperity or profit, planet and peace have to go hand in hand. This is the philosophy behind the sustainable development goals now. So we have to see that how your profit is helping people, how your profit is helping planet or destroying planet, how you are contributing in peace in your personal life. Personal life is the most important. You can keep on arguing, but how to bring that equilibrium in, in personal life, social life, and then the political and, and whatever life. So I would, in the end, I would say that 
we have to dig out something which is the biggest divine wealth given by the heaven, given by the God. And that wealth is compassion. Compassion is the feeling of sufferings of others as your own suffering with a drive, with an urge to alleviate that suffering as you try to end your own suffering. Needless to say that when mother gives birth to a child and child cries, a different kind of feeling come. That is compassion, that is more biological, that is more neurological. It is not a preaching, that is something which I argue sometimes with Dalai Lama and he argues in the same way, so we share this, that it is a biological thing. It is not preaching, it is not a spiritual value. So, compassionate relationship, not just loving and caring relationship. When two of you are living together, or seven and a half million, eight million, billion people live together, how we have to inculcate that value of compassion and expand it? Why you keep your compassion so close to your own siblings or parents or children and so on? Just open it up. God cannot be so meager to give you a, a handful, tiny uh, thing. He has given us compassion. So if you enlarge the circle of compassion, I can hug. I always say that my hands are not so small. I can, I can hug the entire world in my two arms. So that is possible. Your heart should be so big. And it is there. It is there. I tell you. It is. I Believe me, it is. So why not compassion in action? Compassion in politics. If the politicians become compassionate, the world would be sustainable and peaceful and it becomes heaven because then they will see they will feel the suffering of their voters and their citizens as their own suffering in a different way and they will then the power would not be controlled by fewer people and fewer places in the world it would be really democratized so political compassionate religions if the religions uh, religions somehow uh, makes divide in the society and divisions in the society. If you close your minds and say that this is your full stop, don't have question because this is the, this, these are the ready-made answers for 400 years or 500 years or 5000 years, you have to follow those ready-made answers. Then where you, will you go? Where the science will go? Where your businesses will go? Where the civilization will go if there is no question? So compassionate religions will bring societies closer, not divide them, not create hatred in the society. And your question, compassionate entrepreneurship, compassionate business. I tell you, believe me, compassionate corporate business industry is not something which you have to learn from a temple or a mosque. When you feel that the problems and sufferings of the people sitting here in your boardroom is your problem, not competing from inside and laughing and shaking hands from outside, be a little bit compassionate from inside. And then that relationship will make you a good family. The boardroom becomes a family where everybody is ready to help each other. And that is what you said, the partnership in good. That will be built stronger from inside. Similarly, if you feel compassion, the suffering of or problems of those people who are in the, dime, uh, in the, in the entire uh, line below uh, the boardroom, uh, managers and then uh, officers, senior officers, then uh, workers and the people who are producing goods on the ground, if you feel, think of them because you are sitting on the chair in your boardroom because of a long list of people. So we can generate that compassion. Today, tonight, when you go back home, I can, I can tell you just one, one thing. Close your eyes. Think 
that in this room, I am sitting in this room, beautiful place, somebody has built the bricks, somebody has built or produced cements, somebody might have worked in electricity, there is electrician, electrician, there is a cook, there is a cleaner, there are people who protect you, a long list of people. Your parents, your grandparents, your sons, your daughters, your sisters, your brothers, your friends, your, your partners, you are sleeping on this bed because so many people, because so many people. So think of gratefulness for the long list of these people. When I'm sitting here, I'm grateful to all of you. I feel the sense of deep great, gratefulness because I am here because of you. You are not because of me. I can think the reverse. That makes me a better human being. So during the whole day, how many people have helped you? If you just remember those people, do not to do anything, just remember. Perhaps the next day you can gather some courage to say them thank. Thank for yesterday. Um, I made some mistake or I said this thing which was which will not be good for you, but even then you did not react, you smiled. Thank you for that. That will make you a good human being. So, if you are compassionate businessman, compassionate corporate leader, then your production will go high. I can give you many studies and examples in the future that you can also read. Uh, Harvard did some study. Other people did some study. In many places, there are some good studies which have proven that the compassion will help. But I am emphasizing on compassionate entrepreneurship where you feel responsibility for, responsibility for others. So, I say, globalize compassion. Many things have been globalized in the world. This is the time to globalize compassion. Don't hate diversities. Create an algorithm of diversities. Because algorithms are diverse, divert data. So, why can't you create in your mind, the Muslims, Christians, Hindus, whatever algorithm. Come out with good answers, good solutions as you bring the algorithms as engineer. You talk of uh, network of things. Why don't you think of network of responsibilities? Mutual responsibility because we are also interconnected and interdependent. So think of being responsible. May in this part of the world there is no problem of child labor. But you are the part of the world. You, you are not disconnected with the rest of the world. So you should feel some sort of responsibility that will make your business much more profitable, much more productive, much more ethical and human business that you can do. Thank you. Hey Mark, do we have time for a couple of questions? From the audience. Yeah? Okay. Um, any questions? Hey, hi, Sanjay. Yeah. I, I can say a few things, but one thing comes to my mind now. Uh, if you are pure in your heart, you are pure in your name, purity and heart both. That is the meaning of your name. But if you are truthful in some way, if you have a sense of forgiveness for someone sometime, not always, if you have quest for learning new things, if you are simple, try to be as original as possible, not artificial, which is taught in the entire eco ecosystem to be more formal and artificial. Not bad, but inner, in your inside, you can think of those things. This is not because you are a very rich person. This truthfulness, this forgiveness, this quest for learning, kindness does not come because you are a very, very rich person. Wealth does not bring it. 
It is not because you are sitting in, a, in high chairs, presidents, prime ministers, kings, queens, ministers in a country. It is also not because you have a knowledge, academic. It is this truthfulness, this kind-heartedness, the purity comes inside you because there is a child still living inside you. You have not yet killed that child forcefully. So childhood is not just an age factor. Childhood is a divine gift which we can keep forever inside us. Simplicity, originality, purity, truthfulness is something which could be the biggest driving force and nothing can stop. I learn and I'm still learning that I should remain a child. My inner child should grow, but should not become old. Yep, one more question there. Sorry, who's going? Uh, okay, I'll go. Uh, Kalashi, thank you so much for that talk, and you know it really brings you back to center in some ways because we get so caught up with our lives. So thank you for that. Uh, I have a slightly different question. I work with. Uh, an organization in India, in Jaipur, I India. And we've been working with children and a lot of abandoned children. They get abandoned at platforms, railway platforms. Uh, because, you know, economically, sometimes the parents can't afford to keep them or whatever reasons. And I always wonder how we can combine forces between all the agencies like yours and whoever's been working to really kind of synergize because there's so many and I don't know what your thoughts on that are, whether it makes sense to do that or it's better to do it in different pockets. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. This is uh, definitely a very noble and, uh, and uh, an effective way of doing it. Uh, it's a great thought. And uh, I have tried and I still try uh, that if you are alone, or feeling that you are the one who can change the world, this is absolutely wrong. That is never possible. So in the civil society also, there are a lot of egos, there are a lot of uh, you know, personal uh, priorities and so on in the NGOs. There are so many NGOs who are doing so good, but sometimes that goodness does not come mind, that they, they, they do not sink. Um, so, if they are doing good, it is good. But when we launch this global march against child labor, which is still one of the biggest civil society NGOs network, not only NGOs, but trade unions, teachers unions, then corporate uh, groups and so on, government agencies. So we worked with 25,000 non-governmental organizations across 144 countries. Now I am no more uh, sitting in their board and I gave up uh, many of those organizations which, have, which I have uh, founded. Uh, global March is one of them. Similarly, in the Global Campaign for Education, we worked with millions of people and um, almost 12, 13,000 organizations, NGOs across the world. And we came on a common platform. Though they, they, ha they did have their own identities, their own uh, projects and programs and so on. But sometimes it becomes a, it's also a complacency. When you run an organization, an institution, uh, you have different responsibilities to mobilize resources, to give to, uh, to your staff and to, to, to the administration and financing and this and that. And eventually uh, the work for uh, the children or women or men or whosoever. So that, that makes them you know, di different from each other, uh, though it is not necessary. But we don't live in an ideal world. We have to accept it that they have to follow like that. In my case, I don't, I, I, I'm not in my board of uh, Balashram. I'm not in my board of my Bachpan Bachao Andolan. As I said, in Global March case, in Global Campaign for Education case, it was very, very difficult. I had to spend 
sleepless nights for for months i would say not for days to create these organizations but eventually i handed them over to uh, to able people and i thought that let them run the show so i am not really um, working uh, uh, or leading any organization so any organization or any person who can bring the smile in freedom and fearlessness on the face of a child is my brother my sister my organization my friend my partner i work for everyone okay so sorry i think we i have uh, taken the liberty of taking all of your extended time kalashi and taking your time and i know that we've got to come to a close all good things do have to end unfortunately uh, but i want to thank you want to thank you for for being a part of his journey and being here with us um, and all of you who are here uh, my partners in good as i mentioned uh, rajiv uh, narendra the thai charter members uh, and of course uh, how can i forget our wonderful host mark nicholson and the 1880 team so thank you very much and <clears throat> thank you for letting us go on thank you for giving us the opportunity and i wish you um you continue your childhood for many many years and uh, keep giving back to to the world thank, thank, thank you, you so much you have this small uh, thing which i given to, have given to you the small yes uh, uh, i think it's with rajiv um i do have one of them the the, the hummingbird rajiv that box i think he might have left it in his car okay okay It's no no issues no issues i promised you to to tell uh, the story in one minute sure so please. that is my last one minute um when i was uh, called to give my nobel acceptance speech uh, on the podium in uh, oslo uh, i am not used to read uh, my uh, my papers because i can read the hearts of my audience i can feel it and i speak like that so it was very odd for me to read uh, a written uh, written document but they were insisting that uh, because of this uh, uh, this intellectual property and because of the purpose of many researches are done on the basis of those speeches it is necessary to put down something so i jotted down certain things but eventually i lost my papers when i was standing there i was keeping some papers but some of them were missing so i was not nervous everybody was nervous including uh, the king queen prime minister ministers many other dignities from all across the world and as they say that this is this the nobel peace acceptance speech is watched by about a billion people that day or other days so it is one of the most watched things one of the because the most watched thing is the do you know what is that this is the fifa football world cup <laughs> so uh, i cannot compete with that but i lost my papers and a story came to my mind which i read in my childhood there was a heavy fire broken out in jungle all animals were running out rushing for a safer place including king lion and lion noticed that there was a tiny humming bird flying straight towards the fire so he was surprised and he shouted what are you doing committing suicide she said no sir i was born and grew up here i cannot leave it i am going to extinguish this fire he more surprisingly he asked how come then she said sir look at my beak i am carrying a drop of water i am doing my bit she said i am doing my bit and she flew towards the flame rest is the history i said this is my life i am born on the earth i will keep my hummingbird awakened and i will tell everyone you and you and you and you everyone that there is a hummingbird 
who wanted to give back to the society, to the world, is is there inside you. Why you keep it alive and awakened? If you keep it alive and awakened, then the world would be heaven. So I am here to awaken your hummingbird to make this world where every child is free, safe, educated, healthy, smiling. Thank you.